Real News has, in my view, broken new ground by including the Indigenous perspective, offering analysis seen nowhere else on American TV. How should the Obama presidency deal with Iran? In terms of finally establishing a rational framework of discussion, the jockeying for position is already on. In Washington, the National Iranian American Council has sponsored a special presentation to the Senate on change one can believe in as far as the future of U.S.-Iran policy is concerned. And in a joint statement, a group of top scholars, experts and diplomats recommends replacing regime change in Iran with a long-term strategy, allowing Iran its due place in shaping the future of Iraq, Afghanistan and the Middle East, and seriously discussing the Iranian nuclear dossier with no preconditions. In sum, everything the Bush administration has adamantly refused to do. Here, according to an American and an Iranian point of view, is what President-elect Barack Obama should be focusing on. Let me offer four modest recommendations. The first is on timing. The President doesn't want to waste his time negotiating with the a president that may be thrown out of power because of his dismal performance in both economic sphere and domestic policy sphere. Two, that does not mean you don't engage Iran. You do it multilaterally. You do it as part of the other urgent agendas that you have, in particular, stabilizing Iraq and winning the war in Afghanistan. Third, Clarify intentions. President Obama should make clear that the United States has no intention of overthrowing the regime in Iran. I believe the best way to seek regime change in Iran is not to seek regime change. Deadlines and red lines don't work with Iranians. No matter how much you try, they, do not, they will not work. Uh, because of the structure of the Iranian political system and the nature of the Iranian political system. If you have been watching Iranian politics in the past two weeks, you can see, uh, you know, where ministers being impeached, a new minister barely losing in the election, literally fights in the parliament, you can understand that even within the power structure, there is tremendous conflict and competition. Let us say that the current leaders of Iran just disappear for a variety of reasons. This society that, has, that includes so many different factions, what do people expect? That it will just, those factions will just go home and suddenly elect a new leader that is wonderful? You cannot open a Pandora's box in ways and completely ignore the domestic dynamics of a country through tremendous foreign pressure and assume that the end result will be good. I listened to uh, the speeches of Ayatollah Khamenei in Iran and there is never a time where he does not talk about the fact that we do not want to be the servants of the United States. The language of servancy is a very, very powerful language within the context of the Iranian politics and its history of tortured relationship with the outside world. Iran is neither pre-invasion Iraq nor Libya. Iran is a country that is much closer, and I know that people are going to um, be shocked at this, but in terms of characteristics to India. Uh, it's a very complex political system. You can never influence it from outside. Sustained relationship with it, uh, with such a country, will eventually allow external forces to have an impact, but not determine um, uh, the policy direction of the country. There are many areas where you could, by, by a, where you could have discussions that could be productive, that could give the pragmatists in the Iranian of political structure, some idea of the benefits that one gets by, by, having a, by e easing tensions with the United States, and then you're in a better position to engage directly in the, in the nuclear talks. My hypothesis is that the Iranian regime has not yet reached a consensus on whether they want nuclear weapons, but they have reached a consensus on, pr on pursuing the acquisition of technologies that could put them in a position to build nuclear weapons in the relatively near future should they decide to do so. On the question of pressures, the, this argument about increasing both the pressures and incentives is based on the premise 
okay, that the Iranians will ultimately, if the pressure is hard enough, there are elements within the Iranian government that are pragmatic enough that will convince the hardliners to give in. Okay? I'm just trying to tell you, in a competitive political environment, that's a no-no. This kind of talk has actually strengthened yeah. the Ahmadinejad government. Yeah. The Speaker of the Parliament, uh, Mr. Ali Larijani, after listening to Mr. Obama's press conference, uh, in which Mr. Obama um, acknowledged the receipt of Mr. Ahmadinejad's letter, and I think it's important to acknowledge that he has written a letter of congratulations, mm -hmm. uh, and that's an you know that's also a signal. Uh, but um, after listening to him, uh, uh, Mr. Obama saying that Iran cannot have a nuclear weapons program. Um, and obviously that's uh, something the Iranians don't like to hear, the language of nuclear weapons instead of a uh, nuclear energy program. Mr. Larijani essentially said, um, if Mr. Obama is going to talk in the same way as before and not approach the issue strategically, there is absolutely no reason to have a conversation. Donate today and receive a new documentary film available to members of the Real News Network. The History of the National Security State with legendary author Gore Vidal. Bonus features of the DVD include an in-depth response to Vidal from ex-CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who served under seven U.S. presidents, an exclusive interview with Colin Powell's former chief of staff Larry Wilkerson, and an insightful interview with oil policy analyst Antonia Juhas. <laughs> magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Hollywood and Washington, there's a symbiotic relationship. They both deal with illusions. Reality doesn't often uh, play much of a part. I think I saw through the myth of the uh, Cold War almost from the beginning. I was a Washington political kid from a political family. Roosevelt first had radio because he had a, this great speaking voice and everyone liked to hear. Truman proceeded to break every arrangement that Roosevelt had set up for a peaceful coexistence. And Truman thought that it would be a good idea. Why not just stay armed all the time? And then he devised the national security state. You've got to go up and swear allegiance to the United States or else you're a commie. I mean, we, were, we had imported fascism. We get Dwight Eisenhower, who said that we have this great military industrial complex. It is a dangerous thing. And he said, this is going to change everything. And the way our country is governed, it's going to change us politically. Along comes Jack Kennedy, who wanted to make his mark, believed in the Cold War. But he said, in this kind of politics, it is the appearance of things that matters. I think everybody should take a sober look at the world about us. The national security state still exists, only it isn't communism anymore, it's terrorism. This is the most serious thing that has happened in the history of the United States. Knowledge is power. We need an honest new system. We need the real news. This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not gonna sleepwalk into more wars, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Make a tax-deductible donation now of at least $10 a month or a one-time give of at least $75. As a thank you for your support, we will send you the new documentary film, The History of the National Security State. <laughs>